Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in week 6 of the Ramesh Sunni Balwani Theranus trial. As a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranus. Now I repeat that reminder most weeks, but just to add a little bit of colour and clarity to this as we've not seen the actual indictment for some time, here it is. There are 12 counts in all, with three being fraud allegations against patients, or in connection with patients, and seven counts in connection with allegations against investors. Now, there are listed specific allegations of fraud for specific wire transfers of either funds, or in the case of patients' knowledge, but two counts included in the indictment relate to conspiracy to commit fraud, one against investors and one against patients. So who was the co-conspirator in this case? Well, none other than Elizabeth Holmes. So Balwani was co-accused with Elizabeth Holmes, whose trial finished in January this year, and who was found guilty on four counts of fraud and conspiracy to defraud investors. Balwani's trial is being held separately due to claims of abuse that Elizabeth Holmes made against him in her trial. So we continued from where we left off last week with the testimony of Daniel Edlin. You can see his testimony in the Holmes trial here. And as a quick reminder, Daniel was a project manager and worked directly for Holmes and was with the company for many years. In the Holmes trial, we saw that he had micromanaged visits around the Theranos facility to potential investors. So, for example, they would see rooms with racks and racks of Edison devices, but would never be allowed to go in them. And also, they wouldn't see the rooms that had all the third-party machines in that the company was actually using for blood testing. There were the also so-called fake demos that he was responsible for, and in these, an Edison machine would be set up to provide a test to a potential investor. The machine would run a so-called null protocol, and this is where the machine would appear to be working fine, I guess wearing away and lights, screens flashing, etc. However, once the investor had left the room, the sample of blood would be whisked away and run through the third-party machines for testing, and then the results presented back to the investor as if they were from the original Edison machine that the investor had seen. So let's get to it. We had John Bostick for the prosecution and he probed Daniel on how much business experience Holmes and Bowani had. He responded by saying that her experience was limited to Theranos, but when asked about Bowani said that he had had a very successful career. We had the now usual intersplicing of texts that Daniel was made to read out. Balwani to Holmes, can't be apart from you. Balwani to Holmes again, you are perfect. Now the defence were not really liking the line of questioning that Bostick then brought up, which was how old Holmes was at the time of the particular text between Balwani and Holmes. And the answer was, she was about 30 and he was about 38. First thing on Wednesday, Balwani's team tried to get evidence of Holmes' alleged lies about Theranos deals with the military thrown out. Again, from what we heard in some of the investor calls in the Holmes trial, we heard her comment that the Edison devices were used on Medivac helicopters, a statement that turned out not to be true. Now, we saw a lot of emails brought up that discussed the military contracts, either internal to Theranos or between Daniel and his contacts in the military. I should probably rephrase that and say it's the development of contracts with the military that Theranos wanted to get. In all of these emails, uh, we saw that Balwani was not actually CC'd in. Now, the defence have already tried to argue that Balwani knew nothing about these but the prosecution are doing quite a good job tying in Balwani's and Holmes' relationship at the time that these events were going on. And how are they doing this? Well, with the texts, as we've already seen. Let's have a look at a couple more. And these ones are from 2011, at the time that the military contracts were being discussed. Balwani to Holmes, ultimate blessing. Holmes to Balwani, ultimate blessing. Holmes to Balwani, I love you. The inference is that they are evidently, to my mind anyway, trying to put in the juror's mind that Balwani's and Holmes' relationship was so close that Balwani could not possibly not know about details of the military contracts. After all, this could have been a huge deal for the company, and of course we know that investors had made decisions to put money into Theranos, at least in part on the back of the fact that, as they thought anyway, the company did have military contracts. So to wrap up, on the military contracts, Theranos, in other words Dan Edlin, was in contact with them about the test programme from around 2011 to 2014. 
The project kept getting delayed really because Theranos didn't have a product ready to test. When eventually they got to the point where a machine just, just might have been viable, the fact that the machines didn't work outside temperatures in a certain tight range and definitely not in some of the hot climates where the military wanted to use them, Africa, Middle East for example, really killed the project at that point. There were some other texts relating to Holmes and Balwani's use of private planes for their transportation and some of these were extremely derogatory towards some of the cabin crew that they obviously came across. In one text the crew were referred to as effing morons. It's not clear to me whether the profanity in the texts will be redacted in the final texts that get presented to the jurors. Now a side anecdote relating to this, I think I remember in some of the texts or possibly emails between Balwani and Holmes that they'd complained about the flights and that one of them had said that they should get a company jet after the next round of funding. Now I don't know about you, but if I was an investor and the CEO and COO of the company were thinking about using my money for a private jet, which you would guess was primarily for their own use, I might think that they weren't really using my investment appropriately, or at the very least didn't give it due regard. Make your own mind up on that one and let me know in the comments below your thoughts. So Edlin had been putting together marketing brochures for use in the so-called wellness centres that were being rolled out in the Walgreens stores and in one of these a claim was made that all we need is a tiny sample. Well that just wasn't true as the phlebotomists in the wellness centres would take not just finger prick samples that was part of the Theranos selling differentiator but they would in fact take venous draws as well. Also there was a claim in quotes for a full range of tests we now know that Theranos never came anywhere close to that. In fact, their testing capabilities, in my opinion, was woefully inadequate. Edlin said that he believed these claims and others were true. So Edlin quit Theranos after the damning Wall Street Good Journals came out, approximately a year later I think, saying that he had, in quotes, reached the conclusion that the Theranos tech couldn't do what the company claimed it to do. Interesting side observation here also, each of the employee witnesses so far have been asked about their reason for leaving Theranos. Most, but not all, have claimed it in relation to the deficiencies in the company's tech and its own claims about its own tech. We then had the cross-examination and Amy Walsh was up for Balwani. Through her questioning, she tried to make the claims that Edlin did not have deep expertise in the scientists and Theranos IP in particular, and he agreed that, nor did Balwani. The inference being made is how much credibility can we give to his assertion that the Theranos de tech didn't work when he wasn't an expert, and therefore he, and importantly for the defence, Balwani also, again by inference, relied upon what the experts in the company told them. We then heard about the Fortune magazine interview and Edlin says he helped Holmes prepare it. There were a number of action items on a list that Daniel was responsible for. However, key was the fact that Holmes was responsible for the proficiency testing data, the pharma reports and the valuation reports. And Edlin agrees that this information did not come from Balwani. Now just in case you hadn't heard, the Parloff Fortune interview was an extremely gushing piece on Holmes and Theranos and one of the interviews that really helped catapult Holmes into the limelight, and it showed Holmes and Theranos in a very flattering light. We also heard that a small burns test that Theranos did actually complete with the military was a success, but actually needed more participants to conclude. Edlin said that Holmes could really hold a room, was an engaging speaker, had a commanding voice, and that she understood assays, the technical operation of the Edisons, and was an inventor listed on the company's patents. The defence here have really pointed to the fact that, again, as they keep pushing, it was Holmes' business and she was in charge, and therefore by inference responsible for all goings on at Theranos. On the final cross-examination by the prosecution, another factoid relating to the military came out in that the military did take some Theranos devices to Africa to test, but noted that they were never used on patients in the field. Finally, we got a direct connection between Balwani and the military contracts. This was in the form of an email from Edlin to Balwani where he asks him about complying with the military IT requirements and importantly, Balwani was in charge of the IT teams. What about the demo protocol or null protocol that was used on the Edison machine for VIPs? What goal was served by doing this? 
I don't know, said Edlin. Finally, in his last question, Edlin said, When I was asked to compile some investor binders, I recall that Elizabeth told me to get the financial section from Balwani. So that wrapped up both Edlin's testimony and the goings on in the trial for the week. The trial will recommence on Tuesday, that's the 19th of April 2022. If you've liked this series so far, then please hit that like button. And if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you won't miss out on any future episodes. Bye for now.